Good morning. Well, it's great to be gathered, and it's also great to have Steve and Mary, formerly known as Melanie Twally, now with it, with us here this morning. They got married not too many months ago, but how many? Six months. Six months. You couldn't even have a baby in that time. You, you, you just coming down off the aisle. Well, welcome. It's great to have you. So you're moving back, amen? Woo! No, they're not moving back. But I thought I put a little peer pressure on them. There's nothing wrong with that. Teens are not just subject to peer pressure. We got a lot of peer pressure. Think about the clothes you wear, the cars you drive or will not drive. I, I fall prey to that. This podium is a bit high, but I guess I just need to grow up a little bit. So I'm done growing, but I do have a bit of really, really uh, sad news, uh, challenging that uh, um, we, we need to pray about. Um, got word yesterday uh, that a brother in Mexico, uh, his name is Hanso, his wife's name is Gina, he was kidnapped in Mexico. Uh, Mexico is notorious for this, in particular Mexico City. I don't have the details on where at in Mexico, but a disciple was kidnapped and he's being held hostage for a ransom, which is uh, very typical there, especially if you are an outsider uh, coming from another country. They view you as having money and uh, uh, they take advantage of that. And so um, a number of people have asked uh, churches around to just come together and pray uh, for that situation. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Uh, Father, we uh, want to come before you as you are well aware of our brother Hansel, your son. And uh, we just want to come before you begging you as uh, for our brother's life and for his family. In particular, Gina, we're sure she is uh, uh, going through a host of emotions at this time, especially as she's gathered together with the disciples. Uh, Father, we just pray that you would deliver him home safely. We pray, Father, that uh, you would move in the hearts of those who have done wrong and that Hansel's, his example, his godliness would show through and move in their heart. Similar to Paul and Silas being in prison and the jailer being converted, we pray the same, knowing that that is a miracle, but God, none of these things are beyond you. But we pray that you move in a very powerful, powerful way. Father, we love you, we need you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today's text is going to be uh, mostly from Acts chapter 26. And uh, what a fitting... ...thinking that that's right. <laughs> and if it's not, just come on up and fix it. Uh, this is a fitting text because uh, Paul is arrested at this time. And uh, he's arrested because of his faith. Uh, he knew that uh, proclaiming this message of Jesus Christ uh, will in fact bring on many challenges. As I'm sure our brother Hansel understood being in Mexico City when you're not from there or in Mexico, it could bring on great challenge. Um, I've entitled today's message, I Believe in Purpose. I Believe in Purpose. Paul uh, found himself in pretty many, many challenging scenarios, uh, but that did not bother him because he had his purpose on straight. And he knew that his purpose would make, drive him to have certain choices, and those choices, in many cases, would lead him to great persecution. And in this particular case, Paul is now arrested and Agrippa is going to question him. Now this is a funny story in many ways because Agrippa is the grandson of Herod the Great. And uh, that family, that DNA line, had a lot of problems with this whole concept of God. Though Jewish, they uh, had a problem. The first problem was they heard Herod the Great heard that Jesus was coming. This king was coming. And so he executed all the newborn boys in the hopes of stopping the prophecy of the Messiah. Well, after Herod the Great left, 
Herod, his, his son came and he became king and he had issues with who? John the Baptist. John was preaching the word against, in particular, his adulterous marriage and things and he killed, he had John beheaded. Well then, Agrippa, that king, Herod, he died and his sons came along and now we have Agrippa. And now here he is standing in front of Paul and Paul is still proclaiming this same God. And this family has a problem and they're trying to silence the movement of God and that's just not going to happen. They've tried executing uh, both those they thought were. They tried executing the prophet John. They tried going after Peter. Uh, they couldn't get Peter because Agrippa's father who uh, arrested Peter tried to have him killed. But Peter in the middle of the night the angels had him escape. And so now here comes his son, Agrippa. This is the great-grandson of Herod the Great, if you can follow that lineage. Uh, now he's standing in front of Paul. And you know family talks, right? You know that, right? Thanksgiving rolls around. You've talked about everybody that's coming, and you know when they get there, you, you know, you, you're trying to confirm <laughs> if the stories are true, right? You know? My cousin, one year, he was coming to Thanksgiving, and he had a new girlfriend. And his girlfriend was Spanish. Hey. <laughs> we didn't have no problems with that. My cousin Devin was bringing his Spanish girlfriend to Thanksgiving. You know, when you come to the Mitchell's Thanksgiving, let me just tell you, everybody's going to go up and down all over you and find out who you are. That's right, that's right. Now, the biggest challenge that we had was that she didn't speak any English whatsoever. And so we said, oh, we didn't know that Devin spoke Spanish. And Devin's mother, my Aunt Gwen, said, Devin does not speak, speak a lick of Espanol. <laughs> and so Devin brings his Spanish girlfriend, who he can't talk to, she can't talk to him, and we can't talk to her. But she came to Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> we didn't believe it until she came, and we were like, she really doesn't understand a word we're saying. <laughs> And we tried to figure out how they fell in love, but we still couldn't figure that out. That relationship obviously did not last. So you know Agrippa had been talking to all his family about this new way, this, this Jesus, this Messiah, right? And so now you got Paul standing in front of him. Now the cool thing is when you read the text, there's some things that are gonna jump out in light of the lineage. So we're gonna read this chapter. Read in verse one, it says, then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hands and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. Now you know Paul is inside, he's giggling. He goes, here we go again. This family is against us. And he says, I, I consider it an honor to be in front of you today. I mean, he's like, this, this, I think Paul was like, look, God ain't going away. We don't care who you are, how much money you got, how much power, we're still here. He says, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Why is he saying that? Because he knows the lineage too. Now, the interesting thing is Agrippa is standing here with Festus, who's a Roman person. He's got nothing to do with Judaism. And so Paul can make these inside jokes. Yeah, you know about us. He doesn't, but you know about us. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I mean, he went right for it. He says, King Agrippa, you know about our prophecy. Well, he knew he knew because his great-grandfather tried to thwart the fulfillment of the coming king. And he says to him, you know about this. 
I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Why do you think he's saying that? One, it was true, but two, he says, I can identify with you and your family. You, you tried to get rid of anything that had to do anything with the coming of the Messiah. I too was just like you, Agrippa. What is he doing? He's sharing his faith with him. He's saying, look, man, I was where you were. I too tried to stop this, silence the truth about who this Jesus was. Verse 10, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to, the de put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority of the commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, he tells this story. Now, what do you think Agrippa's thinking? Well, in chapter 12, he lost his father. Well, his father came out in all his splendor, and he wore this robe that historians say was filled with all these mirrors all over it. And so when he came out in this beautiful robe, it, it was dazzling like the sun. And it was reflective, and he came out, and they said, this is a god, and they praised him. And then what happened to Herod? An angel struck him down dead. And now here's Paul talking to his son. There was a bright light like the sun. It was all around us. We fell to the ground. I mean, you know, Agrippa's sitting there going, I don't know if I like this. <laughs> He's silent. Verse 12. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 14. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Amen. Now you got I mean, Agrippa is sitting there, and he's got to go, this is my life. Not only mine, but my whole family's life. We've been against this so-called king of kings, this so-called Messiah. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa. I mean, the king is sitting there and hearing this, and he's hearing his whole life in Paul's life, then he's hearing this Jesus say, here's how I feel about your life, Paul, which is the same way I feel about yours, Agrippa. You need to be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And then Paul says, so then, King Agrippa, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. I wasn't disobedient. I mean, man. First to those in Damascus, then those in Jerusalem and all Judea, then to the Gentiles. I preach that they should what? Repent. Turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some of the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond the prophets and Moses said what happened. That the Messiah would suffer as the, first, uh, as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus had had it. He's like, I don't know what these Jewish folks are talking about. Festus had had it. He interrupt Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. And then Paul says, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. 
The king is familiar with these things. I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. I mean, wow, man. He's sitting there and Agrippa is silent. <laughs> Paul is got him. He is silent. He says, I know you believe the prophets. Why? They had heard him. His great grandfather went crazy over him. The prophecy has come. The Magi came. Where is this king going to be born? The star. I mean, he killed babies for this and still couldn't get them. John the Baptist came preaching and he still couldn't silence the movement that God had started. He cut John's head off and Jesus came. They killed Jesus. He rose from the dead and his people are still preaching. Some 30 years later, the movement is still growing. And Agrippa's sitting there going, what in the world am I going to say in front of my worldly friend Festus? You know how it is. Disciple sees you out in the city and you with some non-Christians. Talk about it. Talk about it. Simon roll. Hey, bro, how you doing? They want to give you a hug. You're like, right here, man. This is awkward. <laughs> we can't do this love stuff outside of the building. Let's wait on that. <laughs> you going to midweek tonight? I used to be out walking on college campus and my friends would all see me and they go, where are you going? I was going to Bible study and I, and I had books, which were Bibles. We didn't have digital Bibles then. And they're like, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to study. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we get a little shame. Talk about it. You know, Agrippa's stuck. Yeah. He's either got to submit or reject it. I know you do. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, do you think in a such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? You know, he, he knew where Paul was going. <laughs> you know, he was supposedly giving his defense. But as he shared his story, Agrippa saw his own life in it. And as Paul proceeded, he goes, don't think in this short time, man, I'm, I'm going to become a disciple. In verse 32, Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. You know, I think Agrippa was sitting there trying to figure out how in the world am I going to get out of this one? <laughs> I think he knew that his family lineage had shown that he could not thwart what God was doing. And he, he just said, not right now. Unfortunately, there are too many people that say, not right now. Once I get my life together, then I'm gonna pursue God. Not right now. Do you think that in such a short time I could give up everything and follow this? Not, not right now. You know, I, I'm not there yet. I, I, you know, I got to work up and get my conviction strong and living righteous so that I can really be ready to follow the Lord. You know, following the Lord is about forgiveness. <laughs> my life is, a, is, a, is a, a, an inspiration because of uh, I, I'm forgiven. So therefore, I'm inspired to live a righteous life. My righteousness did not bring forth forgiveness that came from God. Today's message is entitled, I Believe in Purpose. You know, how do we get my life in line with being a thriving Christian? You know, a lot of times we, 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 we wrestle. We say, man, I, I want to be a thriving Christian. I, I want to be a, a, a Christian that's really excited about God and everything. I want to see miracles. I, I want to see my life change. We all desire to do well as followers of Christ. We all desire to see God do amazing things in our lives and those that are around us. We want to see miracles within our families, friends, and neighborhoods. We desire this. We have to believe in purpose. Amen. You know, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, at the bottom, towards the end of the Declaration of Independence, is a sentence that is a little scary. As you read through it, you get to the bottom and it says, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other 
our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This is a unique creed. The signers believed something very special was happening and that God would see them through. It was new in, in a courageous covenant. Men mutually pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to see these things held true. Nine of the signers of the Declaration of Independence did not even survive the war. Many of them lost all of their fortunes and homes in support of their purpose to see this country free. Thomas Nelson of Virginia directed a bombardment of his own mansion at Yorktown. Why? Because it was, it was occupied by Cornwallis. Nelson also undertook to raise $2 million, the equivalent of $50 million in missions money. He said, we gotta raise 50 million to repay the French fleet for its assistance in the war. His war notes when it was all over cost him everything he had. He died in poverty. Francis Lewis, a wealthy New York trader, lost everything he had. His wife was thrown into prison and died shortly after she was released. Richard Stockton of New Jersey, a Princeton grad, lost all of his wealth and property. He had a magnificent library. He lost that too. He was in prison and died following the war. You see, these men, when they began this journey, they had a purpose. And they said that their purpose would not be thwarted by their own wealth, their own lives, or even their sacred honor that their purpose outweighed everything they had. Therefore, they could make choices during the war that supported their goal, and they got to see their dream come true. Amen. First point, purposed, purpose drives the choices in our lives. You know, Paul says in Acts 26.4, he says, the Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they're willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised, that our promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. You know, Paul says, you, you saw my whole life. You see, Paul was groomed at a young age to be a Pharisee. You know, who are these Pharisees? The pious ones, deeply religious, extremely devout. You know, many will read the Pharisees and think that they were hypocrites. That's not what they were. They were extremely zealous for their religion. When the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple, they could no longer have temple worship. They were set in exile. And the Pharisees are the ones that came up and said, well, how can we worship God now if we don't have the ark? We don't have the temple to worship God. And they said, we must maintain the truth of our faith. And it was these guys that maintained the truth of faith. It was these guys that stood up and said, we must cherish the word of God, all of it. Not just the five books of Moses, but the prophets as well. We must cherish this. And then they said, but we don't know how to live this out. The prophets are all dead. God spent 500 years of silence. How do we do this? And they came up with the oral traditions, which were guidelines to fulfill the written scriptures. And in their zeal, they got it off a bit. But in their zeal, it wasn't because of a heart, a lack of heart. They were sold out to proclaiming God as God Almighty. And Paul says, I was the strictest of them. Amen. People saw my life. But it was amazing when Paul got a new purpose, his life changed. Yes. What, the way he lived was different once he got this purpose than what it was before. Why? His purpose dictated the choices in his life. He said, man, I was a Pharisee. Now, you mind you, he's, he's, he's speaking to Agrippa here, and Agrippa was more akin to the Sadducees because the Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. That was it. 
They didn't believe in heaven or hell. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in angels. They believed that was it. You live, you die, and that's it. They were very wealthy individuals. They were very well connected to the Roman uh, powers that be. They weren't spiritual really at all. But the one thing they did have is they had jurisdiction over the temple. They had total control over the temple. Paul says, I wasn't like that. Man, I was a Pharisee. I, people saw my life. There was great passion there, but something changed. He got a new purpose. You get a new purpose, it changes everything. Verse 12, he goes on, he says, he speaks of his journey to Damascus. He says, about noon, look what happened. This bright light, we all fell down, who is it? And then Jesus says something, in verse 16, he says, now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as what? A servant. I have chosen you as a servant. Amen. As a servant. Amen. Jesus makes that choice. Yes. We just got a chance to see the carnation of Jesus with Paul different than with us. It, the same Jesus showed up. Yes. When somebody invited you or reached out to you or studied the Bible with you or talked to you about coming to church, Jesus was right there. He chose you. Amen. For what? That's to right. be a servant. That's right. Every one of us Amen. to be a servant. He says, not only that, he says, I've chosen you what? To, to be a servant. Wow. And also as a witness to what you have seen and what you will see of me. But wait, Jesus is gone. Jesus is still working today. What do you see? I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to, you to them to open their eyes, to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may what? Receive forgiveness of sins. God is not saying, I just want to do this so that you're so righteous, you deserve to be with me. I want to do this so that you could be blameless in how you live. I'm so glad he didn't say that because it would be hopeless for all of us. Might as well shut down the doors, bag it, let's go home, prepare for football every Sunday. He says, I'm only going to do this for one reason, that you may what? Get forgiveness of sins. Our issue is forgiveness of sins. That's our issue. Righteousness is not going to gain heaven for us. So many times we get so jacked up with this whole balance beam. Well, if I'm more righteous than I am unrighteous, I deserve to go to heaven. That is not true. You could be perfect henceforth and still go to hell. <laughs> what? Yes. If you don't have forgiveness, you're doomed. Doomed. Imagine if I'm studying the Bible with someone who doesn't believe that Jesus is Lord, has a different faith, maybe some, an atheistic faith or something. And I say, look, Jesus is Lord. There's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And they get ticked off. And they start yelling at me. They get up, they throw the Bible at me and they leave my house. They get in their car, they start that car up, and they're revving that engine, they put it in reverse and they floor it out of my driveway. But unbeknownst to them, my daughter was at the end of the driveway and they run my daughter over. And they kill my daughter. We are gonna have a problem that has just come to the Mitchell's home. Then the gentleman comes back in my house and he, he's weeping, he's crying, he says, you understand? So what happened? I go, what in the world, what happened? He explains to me. And he says, but listen, I'm going to make things right. I got 10 grand. I'm going to give that to you and say, sorry. Is our relationship going to be okay? <laughs> he says, well, I tell you what, I, there's a puppy store around the corner. I'll get you a puppy. You can name this puppy Camry and I'll buy it for you. <laughs> Is our relationship going to be okay? If he says, I tell you what. I promise never, ever, ever to be angry again for the rest of my life. I guarantee henceforth I will never have an angry moment in thought or deed. Is our relationship going to be all right? 
What has to happen for our relationship to be okay? What's he got to do? There is absolutely nothing he can do. Who can fix the relationship? Me. I got to forgive him. Now that don't make no sense. And I'm preaching. <laughs> you done killed my daughter out of your own anger and I'm the one that got to fix this relationship? I got to fix it? By what? Forgiving. What? How much more so those of us who killed Jesus? I know you're not thinking I didn't. <laughs> yes, we all put Christ on the cross. So do you think if we go to God, God, I tell you what, I give you all my life savings. I promise you, Lord, I'll never, ever, 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 ever sin again. The only way that relationship can be made right is if God gives us forgiveness. We get too enamored with people that live righteous lives. We, we sit there and go, well, you know, they're really righteous, so they deserve God. They deserve heaven. God says, my, your righteousness is like filthy rags before me. You, you understand what I'm saying? I hung out with Michael Jordan one night. Years ago, I had a Corvette at the time, and my best friend was on the basketball team at UMass. And he said to Michael Jordan, he says, oh, Mike, Chip got a Corvette just like you. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> He owns the dealership and I got one of the pieces. He got nine Ferraris and a Lamborghini. I mean, shut up. You understand what I'm saying? Before God, what, what in the world can we do that it's so impressive? The only thing that impresses God is faithfulness. It's the only thing he says, he goes, wow, I marvel at that. He says they need forgiveness. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to what? The vision. You know, God has called us to a purpose. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says that we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making his appeal through us. I mean, that's how he describes us. He says, you are an ambassador for Christ. He says, God makes his appeal through you. You see, Paul got his purpose. When you get your purpose, it drives your life. We read in 2 Corinthians 11 about Paul's life. Paul says, man, I, I don't even want to talk about my life. I, only, I mean, this is foolishness for me to share about my life. And he shares about his life because he goes, man, do you not understand what God has done? Why was his life this way? Simply because he got his purpose. In verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 11, he says, to my shame, I admit that we are too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. They're Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. He says, I have worked much harder. Why was he working hard? Because somebody got up on Sunday and gave an announcement, we need some workers for the Lord. <laughs> now let's get fired up about working. Is that why he did it? No. His purpose made him work hard. When you get your purpose on point, you're going to work hard. You're going to do the things that drive that purpose. You, you follow what I'm saying? He says, I worked harder. For what? Building up the church. Jesus says, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What are you building? See, when you get your purpose on straight, it drives the choices that you're going to make. You know, my daughter came to me on Monday and said, Dad, let's go ride skateboards. Sure. I like riding skateboards. I used to ride skateboards when I was 15. <laughs> so we're riding. We're she gave me the slow skateboard. I said, let's go on that big hill. She goes, I don't know, Dad. <laughs> All right, I'll take the fast skateboard. Oh, boy. I get on that skateboard at the top of that hill. I'm flying. I said, oh, you got to get aerodynamic to get the speed up. 
So I put my hands to the back. I was moving. All of a sudden, now the skateboards I rode were bigger. This is a mini board. You get a mini board going 20 miles an hour, that thing starts going, a wobble, wobble, wobble. But it was wobbling off beat. It was like, whoa. And I was like, oh no. And I tried to stand up to get some drag. And it was wobbling. And I was like, it's going right throw me off. And so I said, oh, I'll jump off and I can run alongside till I stop. You know, you understand what I'm saying, right, Victor? I jump off that skateboard. I got one step. But you know when you fall, you start falling in slow motion. I was like Steve Austin, the six million dollar man. I hit my arm, as soon as I hit it, all the skin, boom, gone. Boom, I flipped over, I was on my back, sliding down the concrete street. And it was sliding, and all I kept thinking, this is not good. I'm thinking my whole back's gonna be shredded. Roll over, rip my jeans, rip my shirt. I had a blue t-shirt on, there were blue stains on the street. My daughter comes running, Dad, you all right? Hit my ribs, I couldn't breathe, so I was like, eh, eh. Cause all I'm thinking is, I gotta be strong. A dude was down the end of the block watching the whole disaster. He comes riding up in a big old truck laughing. I'm like, you don't even know me. I might take this skateboard and bust your window. He's like, you need me help? I'm like, nah, I need no help, can't breathe. I'm like, oh Lord. I'm like, come on camera, we gonna walk back home. And I'm walking like this. I mean, blood is everywhere. I get home and you gotta wash that stuff off. There might be doo-doo stains on the street that got in my skin. I'm thinking I may die. I got in the shower and that water hit, it was like acid hitting all the wounds. Ah! I'm dying. But I can't cry because I got my wife going, oh, I can't take blood. I got my daughter, you okay, Dad? My son just left the building. He's like, I'm out of here. He just left. He left. I mean, I'm hurting. Blood is everywhere. I'm like, all right, take a picture. Upload it on Facebook. Why did I do it? My purpose is to entertain my kids. My purpose is to be given to my kids. I'm not going down that hill again. Although I might, because I have to defeat that hill. And I might get a longer board to do it right when my wife is not going to let me, I'm certain. But I'm going to pray on that one. <laughs> you know, when you got your purpose right, you do crazy things. You do absolutely crazy. I, I, I love my daughter. I, I, I'll do anything for my kids. I, I, I'll, I'll climb a mountain. I'll climb Mount Everest barefoot. No, I won't do that. But I'll do a lot of things. You work hard to build God's church when it's your purpose. When it's not your purpose, then anything to do for the, it, it's in the way. It gets in the way. You know, the kids, kingdom folks come looking, you know what they look like. They got their little notepad and they're trying to find you. You're hiding from them in the fellowship. You take the long route away so that you can, because they're coming to ask you to serve. Oh, I can't do that. Why? Because I don't get up early in the morning on Sunday. It's my day of rest. What are you talking about? We work hard, right? How long? All the days of our life. I mean, what? What? I mean, what? Did you want Jesus to take a day off of righteousness? He says, "I've been more. I've been in prison more frequently." You know, a lot of times we can. In our country, it, it's not likely that we get locked up. We get kicked off college campuses for sharing our faith, or maybe kicked out of the mall for sharing our faith. But are you willing to be inconvenienced? You think about this brother. I mean, he's in Mexico, he knows the challenges, but you're reaching out to everybody. You're becoming known because you're reaching out to strangers and they get a sense of who you are. 
You want to put your life in danger, but you do that when your purpose is on straight. When your purpose is to maintain, to stay safe, and to be at peace and be comfortable, you don't put yourself at risk. You follow what I'm saying? He goes on. He says, I've been flogged more severely and exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. Why? His purpose was on straight. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. Wow. What drove all that? He had his purpose on straight. You know, when you don't have your purpose on straight, this is crazy. When you don't have your purpose on straight, it's almost like people are beg begging and pleading with you to have a great prayer life. You know, say, how you doing spiritually? Ah, I'm not doing that great. You, you praying? No, I'm not praying. Why? I don't have time. Well, what are you doing? Well, I got work, I got this, I got that. See, your purpose is not on straight. So then when someone says, hey, you need to pray, you need to walk with God, they're an irritant because they're contrary to your purpose. Your purpose is to be at peace, to relax and life go well. So why are you going to disrupt my life and want me to pray with you at six o'clock in the morning? I don't want to do that. Your purpose is off. And when your purpose is off, then everything about godliness or commitment unto God and building his church is an irritant. And then you go, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to come to church and just leave me alone. I'm going to get fed and then I'm going to go and have, live my life. When we talk about sacrifice, Paul says, I've gone, I moved from one place to the next, to the next, to the next. Constantly on the move. I've gone with and without. Why? Because his purpose is in the right place. And these are just par, these are just par for the course. Missions and giving to missions, we sacrifice. Why? Our purpose is on right. When our purpose is not on right, we go, wow, this is all I got. And India going to have to live on what I got. I, I can't help them. But yet we get any and everything else we want and need. My wife used to say to me all the time, she goes, you know, honey, when it comes to me buying things, this was years, years, many, many moons, so many decades. <laughs> so far back, I think I was two, maybe one. I don't know, I can't remember, it was so far back. She goes, when it comes to me buying stuff, it's always, wow, that doesn't fit in the budget, or, you know, maybe you can do that over the next course of the year, but when it comes to you, not only do we get it, you figure out a way to get it, and it's always the best and the latest, and I'm like, hmm, so what do you want? <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> you know, our purpose, you know? Somebody laughing over here, they're going to have a conversation with their husband when they get home. Don't tell them I said it. Don't, don't be messing out with me. <laughs> but you know, if you get your purpose right, everything else falls in line. You want to do well spiritually. You feel like maybe you're in a rut. and Man, just don't feel like God is moving powerfully or I'm seeing miracles or I tend to be frustrated more than happy at peace with my walk with God. I go, let's examine your purpose. Is your purpose on right? You see, Jesus says, I'm giving you this purpose. You are my servant to build my church so that the gates of Hades, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I want you to be my servant. When you get that peace on right, the choices then are dictated by that peace. I am a servant of God's church. And therefore, if that's my purpose, everything else falls in place. My priorities in my walk with God, they fall in place. My priorities in serving one another and caring for God's people, it falls in place because it's in my purpose. What I do and what I sacrifice, it's not like it's a burden. It's, but it's according to my purpose. Therefore, I do it and I give my heart 
wholeheartedly to it. And in doing so, God blesses those choices. God brings great miracles. God reveals himself in incredible ways. And we feel filled with God, strengthened with God. And then we're on fire with God. Why? Because our purpose is on right. Let's be men and women that have our purpose on right.